and be like, wow. And I drive, driving in, I thought, my golly, has there been an accident? The parking, I'm just, why in the world are these folks here? And then, then I met some Mike, uh, my bodyguard, I have a bodyguard here. He said, it's because of you. And I said, they've got to be high. <laughs> <coughs> I'm here to talk about uh, fishing guides on Sanibel, Captiva, the other islands. And I was a fishing guide. I got my ocean operators on limited license in 1974, when many of you were not born. And at that, in those years, it was quite difficult to get a captain's license. Uh, you had to lie a lot on the application. <laughs> and then if you were accepted, if you were accepted, you would then drive to Tampa, the Coast Guard Station. And uh, they would give you, the first test was the inland rules of the road. And by gum, you had to know the book. If you passed the inland rules of the road test, you would overnight at the Tampa Barracks, the Coast Guard Station, and then you would take the international rules of the road test, quite complex. For whatever reason, I passed both those. And then the third day, you took the safety test. I didn't do so well. <laughs> But then if you pass that, and I did finally, <coughs> they would give you a physical. That was not the funnest part. <coughs> but overnighting the barracks was pretty fun. And if you, if you spent those three days, if you knew the inland rules of the road, the international rules of the road, you passed all those tests, they then swore you in. It's very, very different now. I remember leaving the Coast Guard station or exiting the Coast Guard station after passing that three-day test. Uh, and there were employers from Texas and Louisiana looking for people who were licensed to run big ships. This is an ocean operator's unlimited license I had in 1974. And people, I tell you truly, truly, truly from the heart, I didn't know anything about running big boats, but I did pass the test. So <clears throat> in 1974, I was a licensed fishing guide. And on these islands at that time, as I recollect, there were only, other, only 13 other licensed fishing guides. You take in Fort Myers Beach, there might have been 17, Boca Grande, probably 20, 25. It was a small, small group of people. Uh, in the 1980s, sometime around there, they, the Coast Guard changed everything and brought in something called the Six Pack, where you could study over the weekend and get a license. And it changed everything. It changed everything. For better or worse, I don't know, and I don't care. But I'm here to talk about fishing guides, and I will start out with a fishing guide story. For more than 13 years, I was a fishing guide, at Tarpon Bay Marina on Sanibel Island. I did more than 3,000 charters. One of my earliest charters is sitting in the front row. What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> Captain Dave, we have a pet name for him, I'm not gonna say it. <clears throat> and I remember uh, Dave's, was it your uncle? Wake up. <laughs> took out Captain Dave, wonderful guy, and a terrific fishing guide. And Dave at that time was probably 10 or 11 years old. 11 years old. And you caught your first tarpon with me. Right outside Tarpon Bay. Right outside, don't tell him the spot. <laughs> uh, but I did more than 3,000 charters at Tarpon Bay. And Tarpon Bay is still a wonderful, wonderful place. Although much changed. And these islands, do change, they do. But they are always the islands. It is my belief, my thought, that I think these islands choose us more than we choose these islands. We are an unusual group of folk, are we not? We're here because we want to be. 
And by gum, there are a lot of people who want to be here, but we're here. And to heck with them. <laughs> we're the guys. <coughs> so I will start off with a fishing guide story. My job at Tarpon Bay Marina was to take people out and catch fish, although occasionally I would take them shelling or take them to Yuseppa. Actually, Yuseppa wasn't even open in those years, or Cabbage Key. And, and my job as a fishing guide was to, you got to help me out here, my job as a fishing guide was to catch fish, catch fish, okay. So I would be up before first light. And I would go out and I'd catch bait. In those years, we didn't use cast nets. We used these big open door drag nets. And we'd dump the net off the stern of the boat and we'd do circles off Woodring Point, Tarpon Bay. And we'd get penfish and pigfish and all kinds of fish. And we'd use that for bait. I'd go back to the dock. <coughs> By now, the sun's up. I'd clean my boat. I'd get ice in the cooler. And, and my clients would come down the dock and I would take them fishing. Come on now. You know, I did that in Palm Beach, this story a couple times in Palm Beach, and there was a long pause. My job was to, and they would say, carry our stuff? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was to take people. Fishing. Don't you just love this place? <clears throat> uh, the most common question asked of me during those years was this. Don't you get tired of taking out all those jerks from the north? My reply was honest. I don't take out jerks. I don't take out jerks. I liked my clients. And every year, almost every year, young families would come back with their children. And they would charter my boat year after year after year. Dozens, maybe more. And over the decades, I would get these wonderful snapshot encounters of this family aging. And by the time I started guiding, in actually 75 I started guiding, by the time I, I never retired, I got kicked out. <coughs> by the time I got kicked out, Tarpon Bay, uh, some of these kids were in college or had children of their own. <coughs> it was delightful. I much miss my clients. 13 years, more than 3,000 charges. I'm curious, any of my former clients in this room tonight? They never came back. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, my first charter was at South Seas. Picked up my clients there, or at least I was supposed to, and I did. Ran up from Tarpon Bay long before first, uh, first light. Cut, acro cut across the old mailboat channel near Chino Island, and, and I ran aground. And, and got out, had to push my boat off, lost a shoe. And then, and then and ran across to South Seas, finally picked up my clients. My first charter, I'm thinking snook, redfish, I'm dead set on ready, got my tackle ready. The first fish ever caught on my boat as a professional fishing guide was a catfish. <laughs> I have been stung by a catfish once in my life and it was on that charter. <laughs> have you ever been stung by a catfish? It is just debilitating, and, and to be a grown man with hair, and I did have hair, and to try not to cry, it's a, it's a test. That was my first charter. But it got so much better after that, largely because of the fishing guides on these islands at that time. They could have frozen me out. I had no right to be one of them, although I had a license. I didn't know diddly squat. And as my former, some of my foreign, former clients will attest, that is true. <laughs> but guides such as Duke Sells. Duke, is that you? <laughs> Duke Sells, stand up. <laughs> Duke Sells was and is a legendary fishing guide, and that is the absolute truth. And these gentlemen had no reason whatsoever to be kind to me or help me. The life of a fishing guide. Um, you meet wonderful people, particularly on these islands, and that is true whether you're a guide or not. 
I believe, one of the greatest assets of living here or being here or vacationing here is the opportunity to meet people you would never meet anywhere else. You truly would not. And I know Duke has taken out luminaries. Captain Dave has. But the people you meet, it, uh, it truly was incredible. Uh, so I would interact with these guys, particularly when we got CB radios. That was quite late in the game, as I recollect. I remember having fishing cards, business cards made up. Uh, Captain Randy White, tarpon fishing, etc., etc. Radio equipped radio equipped. There was another, another wonderful guide on these islands named Belton Johnson. Belton Johnson, I believe, was born somewhere perhaps in La Costa in 1901, 1902. Started guiding in 1925. And I went, when I was filling out my application to apply for a, a guide's, a captain's license, I went to Captain Johnson. And a classy man who had taken out Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Charles Lindbergh, and a wonderful, wonderful man. He lived very near where we are right now. And I said, Captain Johnson, at that time, uh, on your application, you had to prove three years of commercial uh, experience. And Captain Johnson said to me, they're never going to look at that. Just lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. <laughs> But that wonderful Freemasonry between the fishing guides on these islands was very different than in the Florida Keys, and I do not know why. I truly don't know why. Perhaps it's because the people we interacted with generally tend to be very, very classy. Maybe it rubbed off. I don't know. Um, in all my years on Sanibel, Captiva, it does date back some, not as much as others. In all my years, I have met one snob. That's true. And I can't remember her name. <laughs> and it goes back 20 years. I just, the people you meet here are wonderful. I'll talk a bit about Tarpon Bay. Uh, and Neville Robeson may help me out here. Tarpon Bay was run by a guy named Mac, Mac Hamby. Mac as in my novels. If you're one of the millions who have not read my novels, <laughs> good call. <coughs> but Mac ran our marina. Mac was an unusual guy. Mac was from Washington, D.C. He'd been a banker, made a lot of money, took a flyer on a marina on Sanibel, Tarpon Bay. Mac being unusual. If you were a straight, hard-working lug, Mac probably would not hire you. But if you had some oddities or quirks, Mac might. <laughs> well, for instance, he hired me as a fishing guy. There's one right there. Another was uh, he hired a wonderful guy, Nick Clements, uh, to work at the marina. In my novels, I call Nick Clements Jeff, Jeff Nichols. Jeff and Nick have had a terrible stutter. Nick had a terrible stutter. Big, tall, good-looking guy. We called him Jeff because he looked like Jethro Bodine from the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> and a, a cleft chin and just a big, strong, great looking guy, but he had a terrible stutter. So Mac put Jeff in charge of answering the phone at the <laughs> fish market. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And, and when the guides, Neville and I, Dave Case, or Alex Payne would come in for lunch and Jeff would be behind the fish counter, Nick is his real name, and the phone would ring, and we would all lean a little bit <laughs> to hear Jeff answer the phone. And the first question, inevitably, when somebody calls a fish market, is what fish is fresh today? And we would listen to Jeff say, well, today we have <laughs> grouper, <laughs> and we have snapper, and we have mama, 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 dolphin. And <coughs> And on those rare occasions Jeff got out the word dolphin, the caller had to wonder why there was wild applause in the background. <laughs> <laughs> that wonderful small family at Tarpon Bay, but also at Tween Waters and beloved Jensen's and South Seas and Sanibel Marina. It was a wonderfully tight-knit, 
eclectic, unusual group of guys who we really did try to help each other. Well, at least they tried to help me, and, I, and they certainly did that. In 19, <coughs> late 1987, the federal government came to us at Tarpon Bay and told us they were closing Tarpon Bay to powerboat traffic. They gave us two no months' notice, and I was out of a job. And I was not, nor am not, qualified to do anything. And that is true. I didn't go to college. There was really no need for me to go to college. I went to high school in Iowa. There's clearly no one from Iowa in this damn room. <laughs> so I was out of a job. But I had been working hard at learning the craft of writing during my free time as a fishing guide. Now that meant staying up late and getting up very early. And for a fishing guide, by golly, that is early. <laughs> and, and, and writing and trying to learn the craft of writing. In the 1980s, I had a very lucky break. Rolling Stone Magazine started a magazine called Outside Magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It is still a terrific magazine. <coughs> Terry McDonald, who went on to become the editor of Sports Illustrated, Esquire, others, hosted Saturday Night Live. Terry McDonald was the editor, and I sent them a story over the transom. That's the phrase magazine people use, over the transom. I paddled a canoe from Pine Island down to Isle Morada. I went through three partners. None of them like me even now. <coughs> but I wrote a story about that, sent it to Terry, sent it to Outside magazine, magazine. Some college kid, and that's the way it works, picked this story out of thousands of scripts. And Terry McDonald called me, and he said, called me at the marina at lunch. And he said, we can't use this. I went, well, thanks for calling. <coughs> he said, no, we want you to try something else. We want you to try something else. So I wrote a piece for Outside. And it appeared in their, the first year outside was in business, 1987. So fortuitously, fortuitously, uh, when the marina then closed, I had at least some small writing credentials. And I do remember the marina closed powerboat traffic, I think in February of 1988. I was guiding off a trailer, and uh, I, I, I knew I had to do something. So I wrote a book. I wrote a book. I do wish I'd have learned to type. Uh, <laughs> wrote it on an old Underwood stand-up typewriter and sent it in. And I remember September of 1988 having yard sale and going through the couch looking for quarters. It was that tight. And Sanibel Flats, my first novel under my own name, came out to very nice reviews. And that year, I think, by gum, we probably sold 17, 18 copies. <laughs> and <coughs> so it was not lucrative, but it d did go from there. I do miss those marina years. I miss the marina family. But I'm so doggone glad that marina closed, I can't tell you. Because it's just, it has just worked out swell. Yeah, one more quick story, we're done. Um, during those years I was guiding, uh, Belton Johnson, a wonderful man, uh, t would talk to me, lovely, gracious, and, and, and had no problem sharing advice and information. Esperanza Woodring, Tarpon Bay. Esperanza Woodring, I think, was born on La Costa. 1901. 1901, and a, 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 a fishing guide. On Sanibel at the ferry landing, there used to be a sign. And this dates back before 1961, when the, when the causeway was built. There used to be a sign at the ferry landing on Sanibel, and the sign said, all of our fishing guides are gentlemen, <laughs> except for one. <laughs> and she's a lady. <laughs> and that was Esperanza Woodring. And the 13 years I guided out of Tarpon Bay, I would see Esperanza Woodring at that time in her 80s, 70s and 80s, in her little green boat with her clients. And she was out there every single day fishing with her big, big hat, hat and long sleeve shirt. And Esperanza Woodring did not brook fools. And she had a tongue like a sailor. <laughs> and I avoided Captain Woodring. 
However, there were times where a little boat would break down and I would stop, help her get that crank, little crank start engine going, and she'd always say, thank you. I'd say, yes, ma'am. Very polite, but she did not like boats around her, and I avoided Mrs. Woodring, Captain Woodring. And so <coughs> after 1987, when the marina closed, maybe 1990, for whatever reason, the local PBS station had me do a series of TV shows called On the Water. Anyone here saw them? Well, you didn't miss much. <laughs> it was kind of like a cross between um, Wild Kingdom and Leave it to Beaver. It just <laughs> <laughs> but we did have some great guests, one of whom was Esperanza Woodring. <coughs> and, and Esperanza had never done a video interview, had never done any interviews at all, to the best of my knowledge. And I so wanted to get her on this show. And we had had some wonderful guests, Koch Brown, a man born in the mangroves, 10,000 islands. Guy Bradley, the grandson of Guy Bradley, the Ottoman game warden who was murdered in 1905 and changed everything in terms of plume hunting and conservation. And I so badly wanted to get Esperanza Woodring on the show. And I had seen her peripherally, knew her peripherally for, by then, almost 20 years. And so I called Esperanza's son, Ralph Woodring. And do you know Ralph? <laughs> Big, strapping, a brilliant guy. And Ralph will do this, oh, I don't know nothing. He is smart. He can lead people. In, and big, strapped, tough guy. So I called Ralph and I said, Ralph, I'd, I'd sure like to get your mother on this TV show. She's never done a show before. And Ralph said, well, why don't you call her? I said, well, Ralph, your, 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 your mom scares me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Ralph said, hell, she scares me too. I ain't calling her. <laughs> so I, I called Mrs. Wardering. I said, would you be on the show? She said, I reckon I will. She was on the show and went out in my flat skiff and Esperanza, Captain Woodring's little green boat. And, and she told these marvelous stories. She had grown up in Tarpon Bay. I said, Captain Woodring, when you look back all your life, is there one day, one memory from Tarpon Bay that really stands out in your mind? And she said, yes, there is. There was one morning I woke up and the bay, it was slick calm. And the bait, the bait was on the surface like a squall, like a thunderstorm, so much bait on the surface. And there was tarpon, tarpon, tarpon coming up under the bait with their mouths open, coming up slow like whales. It could, you could see the bait pouring out their gills. I remember that stories she told were incredible. And I got a little full of myself. I said, Esperanza, I didn't say Captain Woodring, I said, Esperanza, you know, I was a fishing guide here for quite a while too. Can you talk a little bit about, there's so much boating traffic now, just basic boating courtesy. And Mrs. Woodring looked at me and she said, yes, I will. I recollect the day I was out fishing my clients up outside Greenpoint. It's right on the inside of Woodring Point. And one of the big fast speedboats come flying past, wash my little green skiff into the mangroves. Woman on my boat, she started crying. The man, he got mad. I had to take him back and I didn't get paid. The 92 year old Esperanza Woodring looked at me and she said, and it was you, you <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Mrs. Woodring, that wasn't five years ago, ma'am. That was 15 years ago. <coughs> and ma'am, I stopped and apologized. And ma'am, not only that, when I got back to the Marina Tartan Bay, I drove clear around to Woodring Point. I knocked on your door, ma'am, and I apologized again. She said, yes, you did. Apology accepted. <laughs> Anyway, I apologize, apologize if I've gone on too long. <laughs>